All right. So we started a series last week. It's going to go for six weeks, trying to work on our identity in who God says we are. This is unscripted, but Mark, is there any chance you have those, tri- those circles? I know it's a bit unscripted. If you have it. Right. If you look there, <clears throat> circle two or segment two is what God says about you and about what God knows to be true about you. Segment three or circle three is what you believe to be right about yourself. What you believe in circle three to be right about yourself is what you have learned growing up as you've been fashioned in the home you grew up in, circumstances you grew up in. And then segment one is where what God sees about you and what you see about you eventually start to align. You and I are meant to learn to live, especially in our thinking, we're meant to learn to live in segment one. It's a safe place to live. It's where your mind is renewed according to what God thinks about you. And the whole of last week, for 30 something minutes, that's what I talked about. And I said that there are a number of identities in the book of Ephesians that you and I need to own for ourselves. We have to change our stinking thinking. We have to start believing what God says about us. That segment one needs to grow. And so today we're going to handle the first of them. So uh, if in your identity workbook, you'll see on page six are your Sunday notes for today. All right. If you've got a pen right in there on the top, here's your heading. I am a child. Maybe write that in. I am a child or even better, I am his child. And then in brackets, he is my father. I am a child or I am his child. He is my father. You will see that this coming Wednesday, for all of those I saw, this Paul was packed this last Wednesday around those who came for the midweek sessions. I want to tell you, you'll get the most out of this time by doing the midweek sessions as well as the Sunday sessions. If you can't get your whole family came to me last week with their kids. I said, bring your kids anyway, or we, we do have the facility online in terms of PDFs. There are ways. Go to the info desk. We'll tell you how to do it. But the midweeks are important. And this coming week, you're going to see on page seven, your midweek notes. If you are following your daily devotionals, I certainly hope you are. Today's like your off day. Tomorrow morning you start, or if yesterday was your off day, you start today with week two in terms of your identity. Please be reading through, working through the material. This morning, I am a child. He is my father. I want to tell you, it's a weighty matter when you start to talk about God the Father. One of the leading problems today, statistics, surveys, studies will show you. One of the leading problems in society today that contribute to far greater problems are fatherless homes. It is estimated that over 80 to 90% of criminals, people in jails around the world today, grew up in homes with single parents and absent fathers. Fathering is a critical role. And you and I can agree that moms and dads play a massive role in defining us as we grow up. Character, experience, moments, events, things that life just throws at you most unexpectedly. And your mom and dad, in a sense, would, they try to be there for you. If you're a parent today, think how overwhelming your love for your children is. You have to show them love. There's moments you don't, like exam times, room inspections, giving them chores. I don't think that's very loving. But outside of that, there's nothing we won't do for our kids. There's no price we won't pay, no burden too heavy to carry. There's a sense of responsibility. There's cost involved. Time, money, energy, worry, anxiety, stress, disappointment, joy. Your children become your greatest treasure. Your everything. And have you ever noticed when you became a parent, you didn't even realize you had that in you? It's rare that you take that little sprog, you want to push it back. It's rare. More often than not, you're happy to have them. They're a delight in your life. 
And there's a big difference between your pregnant wife and your wife holding a baby, isn't it? When she's pregnant, you still feature. The moment little crybaby is born, you are relegated. But not for long. 20, 30 years. So, and then you'll come back into the picture eventually. But your kids become your greatest joy. Doesn't it ever make you think about how God, your father, feels about us as his children? He feels what we feel as parents, but far more deeply and far more intensely because God is just so much more than we are. His capacity to feel and to act is infinitely greater than ours. And because God can feel infinitely greater than ours, you and I can affect His heart for good or for bad. We can fill His heart with joy through our obedience and our being transformed by His world. We can fill His heart with sadness, isn't it? God can grieve. God can be disappointed. God can be, you can read in Scripture. We have the ability and uh, the power to affect the heart of God. Have you also noticed when parenting... That things can sometimes get harder, not easier. Your kids go through challenging phases. Everyone talks about the what terrible twos, troublesome threes, whatever, whatever. Wait till they get till their teens. And the arm hair starts growing. Things change. And then you get the boys. <laughs> Sorry. I had to. And when your kids change and they get older, they get independent, they get combative. And when they get combative, do you find that you react sometimes? And the, I read this, and the way you react sometimes isn't exactly biblical. And have you ever found you have to apologize to your own children sometimes for your conduct? It's humbling, but it's necessary. You've got to call them in and say, okay, boys, listen, that, that wasn't right. I remember listening to one of my sons playing this music the other day. And the old bomb was dropping out in the words. I said, what's this? He said, it's words. Dad, it's not influencing me. I said, come on, that will influence you, boy. He said, Dad, I've heard you in the traffic from time to time. <laughs> True story. And he says, and you don't even listen to my music. So it's not the music because we're in the same car. <laughs> and I won't tell you his name, but Luke is too clever for his own boots. They'll be at the, at the 10 o'clock. We'll, we'll, uh, I, mean, I won't mention that example then. <laughs> but you'll end up having to apologize, hey, because as a parent, your behavior isn't always perfect. And we need to realize that as we grow older in our relationship with God, sometimes we treat God the same way. We think in His imperfection, He shifts according to our sin like we would if people sin against us. The reality is we have a perfect Father who is unchanging. And in the same way that you and I give our commitment, our lives, our protection, our love to our children, is the same way, only better, that the Father sees and treats you. Yesterday, today, and forever, because He is God, our Father. And you and I need a deep revelation of God the Father to resonate in our hearts. Because when we look at society with broken homes through fatherless families, it's easy to disqualify our Father in heaven because of the effect some of us have experienced from our natural fathers. When our natural fathers dropped us, let us down, weren't consistent, we think, is God any different? We have no framework. We don't understand how there can be a God in heaven who will love us through all our stuff. We can't see it because very often our earthly parents reward us according to achievement, not just for being. Not enough do we just go to our children and just say, I love you and I'm proud of you. Why? Just because I do. It's based on stuff. You measure, we speak well of you. You don't, we quiet. We need to trust God to bring a transformation in our hearts. That part of our identity is, I am a child. And he's my father. That's the whole thing for this morning. So if you turn to page one in your identity book, right to the beginning. Read out of Ephesians chapter one. It's our anchor series. Starts like this, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, 
Grace and peace to you from God our Father. Maybe underline Father if you want to or circle it. I did in my Bible, uh, in my notes. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father. Underlined it again. I circled, sorry. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And then verse 17, I'll read to you. It says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, and I circled it. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know Him better. We need to learn to know Him better, friends. If we go back to verse 4, key text for this morning. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus. Think about the idea of adoption in South Africa today. If you've been adopted and the process, process has gone through now and it's finished, do you know that all your previous names on your original birth certificate are erased and you are issued a new birth certificate with your new name? And your new birth certificate contains the names of your adopted parents and their surname and immediately you step into a new name, a new identity and a new inheritance. And no matter where you go in the world after that, you are settled in who you are. It is signed, sealed, and done. Our oldest boy is adopted, David. It's not a surprise. We, the social worker told us from the time he can begin to reason, celebrate his adoption, that he was chosen. That his other two brothers later, you get what comes out. Is that okay? <laughs> With your own natural kids, it's a lucky packet. Yeah, there it comes. But with adoption, you get to choose. With adoption, you get to have a good look and you determine, I want this child. And David, where he was born, um, the names he was given at birth in the hospital are all erased. And today he is David Michael Garrett, carries my name, will carry my inheritance, will carry everything with me because I chose him as a son. And no matter when we, I've taken him overseas, I've done this and that with him before, wherever he goes, he shows his ID or his passport, he's my boy. There is no reference to his being anybody else's. He's my boy. Are you okay with that? And Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that as soon, as soon as we are saved, and we are, we are moved from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of God our Father, and you receive sonship immediately and irrevocably. You are declared a child of God. You are a son or you are a daughter of God immediately. And you're given access to inheritance, to uh, authority, to every spiritual blessing immediately. It's not a process. Think about when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Part of what was finished is a new grace, a new covenant. Pain and sin no longer rule. And part of what he meant, I believe, when he said it is finished, is your identity is set. I paid a price that your identity can be set. You will be bought. Sonship will be given you through the process of adoption. And you will belong to God as a father. Jesus was passionate that you and I understood God as father. When we even are taught the Lord's Prayer, our father in heaven. When he prayed, he talked about his father, his heavenly father. God doesn't just want a Jesus does not want you and I to just see God as a ruler, as a king, as a sovereign. He wants us to know him as a father. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. Through Jesus, we get to be in relationship with the father. And I want to say to you this morning that relationship with the heavenly father is the ultimate reality for you and I as believers. And I also want to say, your conduct with others is a direct reflection about the way you are allowing or not allowing your Father in heaven to father you. It's how much you allow Him to. And Jesus wants us to know about the Father. So in one of the most brilliant parables that He tells, Jesus tells a story about a son who is prodigal, which means wasteful. But actually, Jesus is teaching us about what the Father is like through this parable. We should actually call it the parable not of the prodigal son. It should be called the parable of the loving father. Let's look at some of the characteristics. In this passage we're going to look at now, there's a lost coin, a lost sheep, and a lost son. And Jesus is saying in all three instances, something has been lost 
that needs to be reclaimed. And in this particular story, what needs to be reclaimed for you and I is the attitude and the character and our perception of the father. Many of us can identify with the prodigal son or the older brother, but how many of us can identify with God as our father? So if you have a Bible, please turn to Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. To illustrate the point further, oh, wait a second, that's New Living Translation. I want to go to the NIV. I love that I can have like every Bible on you. It's so lacquer. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property among them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have got food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he says, He's got a plan now. So he got up and he went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. This is the script, remember. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. A dad lives with his two boys on the farm. They're evidently wealthy. One day the youngest son has obviously had more than enough of farm living. Comes to his dad, give me an inheritance, everything owed to me. The father gives him his inheritance, he gives him wealth. The son leaves, he parties, he lives wildly. We all can see what happens after that. It's predictable, isn't it? Squanders his possessions, squanders everything he has, suddenly finds himself his need in need. His friends have left him because there's nothing more they can take from him. And finally, he gets a job. How weird does the circle turn? From being a younger son on a farm in a place of authority, he's now a nobody on another farm with no authority. From a son, he's now a servant, and he's got absolutely nothing. All he can do is feed pigs. Now, under the circumstances, I can imagine it's quite tough. He's obviously in a different country. He's a Jew, but he's in a different country, and he's not supposed to have anything to do with pigs. Now, he's got to feed them. He can't even eat pig, pig pods. Was it because there was no food for for not enough food, was it because they were watching him? I don't know why, but the, he could feed the pigs, but he couldn't even take enough for himself. Very shameful. And he comes to his senses and says, I'm going to go to my dad and I'm going to be a servant. And now we're going to see how the father's heart is revealed. The narrative moves from this boy and his pity party and what I'm going to do, and he's still making plans. The, the story moves to a father. And the father, a long way off, is looking. He's waiting. And, and what we need to see is what Jesus is trying to tell us about the father it's a powerful story and there are four truths we need to pull out of this for this morning if you know i want to understand the father better the first one is this the father loves me unconditionally the father loves me unconditionally this father suffered rejection from the boy when the son comes to a dad and says give me an inheritance he knows an inheritance is given when a father dies. So he's saying, Dad, you know what? My life would be better if you weren't here. More than I value you, Dad, I value what you give me. And you can't give me till you die. So I almost wish you weren't here, but you are. So won't you just give me what you could have, would have given me if you die? Because I don't want to wait anymore. How does the father feel? How does the father feel, I mean? And then he goes. He still carries the same name, rep represents his family, and shames them all through his wild living. Loss, sadness, disappointment, etc., etc. If you and I as human beings go through this kind of rejection, if you and I were parents and our father, give me, give me everything. Your kid comes, give me everything. I'm, I, or someone else treats you badly. What do we do? Don't we tend to respond 
the same way we withdraw or we reject right back again. We get hurt, we hurt back. Not the good father. And Jesus is teaching us something about this father. Despite everything the son has done, the father's still waiting. The father's still watching. The father is still willing to lavish forgiveness, acceptance, and love on that boy. Not once does the father's attitude change towards the son, regardless of what he's done. And over and over again, the Bible tells us how much the heavenly father loves us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what great love the father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Exclamation mark. The reason the world doesn't know us is that it didn't know him. They don't know our love for God and God's love for us because they don't know him. This lavish love is like a waterfall that keeps on flowing. That's what John's trying to say. God just keeps lavishing love on us. Psalm 103 verse 11, David says, As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Now David says his love is infinite. Jesus says his love is lavishing. David says his love is infinite. Do you get the lavishing infinite love of God on you today. There is nothing you've ever done, nowhere you've ever been, nowhere you've ever run that will reduce the Father's love for you. There is nothing you could have done here on earth that has reduced the Father's love for you because the Bible even says, while we were yet sinners, He loved us and sent His Son to die on a cross for us. The catch is, we have to own it and we have to receive it when he gives it. Are you in a place this morning where you're actually able to allow your mind to comprehend the fact that you have a father in heaven who loves you unconditionally? Who's not holding a bit back because of what you've done. What's interesting in the story is it doesn't say the father in looking for the son. It said the father waited for the son to come back to him. And I'm telling you, so many of us are waiting for the Father to do something. People out there, I'm waiting. The Father, I'm waiting for God. Have you ever thought that God's waiting for you? When it's time for your attitude to change, when it's time for you to do an adjustment in your life, God has been and will always be waiting. True transformation only comes when we need the Father and we come back to Him. And I don't know where you are this morning, but I want to tell you, I believe God wants to release a coming back to the Father. I believe God wants to bring a coming back to God by the Holy Spirit drawing people. You and I, you're either in this room today or you've got family or friends that you need to be bringing and inviting here because, they, because God is waiting. The Holy Spirit is drawing. They've squandered their lives out there and there's an opportunity for a new life. And don't hold back on showing people the way to get in there. In the heart of the Father is a longing, a waiting, an inviting. He longs to be with us. And he will love unconditionally, number one. Number two, the Father not only loves me unconditionally, the Father embraces me. The Bible doesn't say the Father waited looking down the road. He saw a speck. He knows it's his son. And he runs. It says, doesn't say that. He ran to his office, got out his study, his journal, and rent and rewrote, reread everything he'd ever written that that boy had done. And while the son's still coming, he looks at it and says, oh, let me just remember. Let me get angry with everything that little toffee did. Look through it, call your friends, call the other servants, slander his name a bit. I want you to know it, so-and-so did, so-and-so did this wrong for me. I want you to wait till that little guy comes here. The Bible says, while a long way off the father saw him filled with compassion, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Jesus is trying to show you and I, the father is not heavy-handed. Humanity develops this idea, God's going to punish you. Like he's got a book and all the things you've done wrong and he can't wait to punish you so you can earn your way back to sonship. Jesus is saying to you, when you're a long way off, the Father sees you already. He's filled with compassion for you. He runs towards you. He wants to embrace you as long as you're coming. He wants you to change the way you see God the Father. And last week, week one, in the identity gap, that circle two remembers what God sees in me that I don't believe about myself yet. Circle three are the things I do believe about myself that are often lies. And God wants us to, to move back to number one. 
We, and in this series, we have to try and pull those circles closer. Please stop saying the same stupid things in six weeks' time. Please don't come for a counseling session and say, I don't know if God loves me. I swear, I'll take you by the ear. I'll take you to a YouTube channel. I'll put this on and say, watch it. How many times? Till you change. You've got to get the Holy, allow the Holy Spirit to get in there and change the way you're thinking. Because if you don't, you'll never see God. You're only going to see God as too heavy-handed or too lenient. He either lets you get away with everything or he lets you get away with nothing. And it'll change your approach toward him. He wants you to know he loves you unconditionally. As a father, he embraces you. And number three out of four, he forgives you completely. If you're writing notes, if you've underlined that, God forgives me completely. Won't you circle that word completely, please? It is such a key word. The son comes to the father in verse 21. Father, I've sinned against heaven and, and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now that's a true statement. He isn't worthy anymore. He has blown it. He has messed it up. But there's two powerful things we have to see that happen in that moment. Number one is repentance. The reality is you and I will never ever know how amazing the father is until we understand how rotten we are as people. And do me a favor, stop pointing the finger at everyone else who's wronged you. Look at yourself first. This is a different son we see here now. In the beginning, the son is arrogant, he's demanding, he's entitled. Give me, give me. Now we see a son who realizes there's no wealth in the world compared to the privilege of being a son in the house of his father. He's even willing to come back as a servant. It's better to be a servant in my father's house than it is to go and live out there with all the wealth. Because I realize out there I'm not safe. It doesn't matter what I have. You know why? Because when I'm out there, I'm left with me. And no money can stop me being me. I remember I went to a man once, a guy in our church, very wealthy guy, he relocated, retired down to Sedgefield. And I remember I said to him once, it's amazing how money changes people. He looked at me and said, Greg, money changes no one. I said, it does. I've seen it. Money changes people. He said, no, money simply empowers you to do what you always wanted to do and to be what you always wanted to be. It was always in there. I thought, man, that's good. I'm going to use that in future. So here we did. This is repentance. When you come humbly before the Father, you acknowledge that being with Him is far more important than having anything else in your life. You come in repentance. God, I realize I need you. Then number two happens. Complete forgiveness from the Father. He comes back wanting to be a servant. But you know what? The only reality in the Father's heart is not my servant has come back. It's my son has come back. The only reality in the heart of the Father is I'm looking for a son. I want a son. Not just a servant. There's nothing in the Father that inclines the Son to become a servant again. In your connect group last Wednesday, this, your midweek group, you should have had the fill-in words, a statement on page five. If you got your book, you just turn back to stage five. It says there, um, the first sort of paragraphy thing says, when we are made new by God, we are immediately, maybe you want to underline that, we are immediately loved, forgiven, accepted, adopted, chosen, blessed, the Father's light, redeemed, spiritually rich, etc. We are immediately those things immediately this is not progress you need to own the word immediately you're right you are immediately forgiven receive your forgiveness you see that guy went to go and get a mamba out of someone's this week out of, out of someone's car i had the mamba bit them guess what immediately they went to the doctor and literally stopped breathing in the doctor's room 15 minutes later and got resuscitated immediately. Boys, when your wife looks at you and says, the garbage needs to go out, I suggest, immediately, do what you're told. Is that okay? Or when she drops that ever so subtle hint, oh look, February 14, it's Valentine's. Immediately start sweating. Number four, the Father transforms me. 
This little boy leaves home arrogant, he comes home humble. He leaves home self-centered, he comes home father-centered. He leaves in rags, his father gives him a robe. He leaves barefoot, his father gives him shoes. And those, in that culture, sandals were not given to servants or slaves. Only sons wore shoes. His father gave him a ring. In the culture of the day, the ring was a signet ring. You went into town, you bought everything you needed to buy with a signet ring. It was a guarantee that your dad will look after you. Not only did he restore him to sonship, he restored him to his position and privileges of a son. And the day you give your life to Jesus Christ, or the day you repent, the day you come back to him, he restores not only your identity as a son, he restores your privileged position as a child of God, as if nothing had ever happened. I want to close with this. Just a thought. When the Father forgives you your sin so completely and puts a ring on you and a robe and shoes and acknowledges your Father and hugs you and holds you and tells you how much He loves you, when He brings you into the home again, can I ask, dare I ask, that from that moment on you go and treat everybody else the same way? Huh? You stop airing yours and other people's dirty laundry. You stop talking about or talking to. You let it go. From that moment on, the way, because remember, the measure you use will be used against you. And you resolve from that day that if something is God-fearing and God-honoring, I say it. If not, I learn in biblical language to just shut up because there's another brother in the picture which I haven't got time for but he totally dishes the son who comes back because of a chip on his shoulder it's so unhelpful but so necessary that Jesus had to put that in and you and I need to get deep down into our hearts revelation that God is our father Ephesians 1 17 says I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know Him better. Can I just say to you this morning, you are loved unconditionally. Put those four up there, Mark. Get it in your head today. You are loved unconditionally. The Father wants to embrace you. The Father forgives you completely and the father wants to transform you completely you okay so here's how we're going to close this morning i was all ready to read out the old creed but we're going to do it differently today would you stand with me please thank you so much for being a part of our meeting today um can I just ask two things? The first is, if today the, the message has in any way been useful to you, would you mind just maybe liking it or putting uh, perhaps a statement down or a comment down that we can know how the ministry has helped you? Maybe a, a thumbs up, maybe you can subscribe to the channel, do whatever, just so we can know what impact this message may be having on you. And secondly, you may be someone who's saying, Greg, I hear you, and this, this, this hope, that Jesus has for us can come into my heart and it can change me but the reality is that I don't even know if I know Jesus I want to say two things to you right away the first is he's near you right now the Bible says if you believe in your heart that he is the Lord and if you confess him with your mouth you will be saved which means you just need to where you are turn to the Lord Jesus Christ even now and just say Lord here I am I recognize who you are I confess my sin to you I acknowledge you as Jesus Christ the Lord of all the son of the living God and I want to follow you I want to become a disciple of yours I want to I want to give my life to you Lord and you can pray that prayer right now between you and the Lord secondly you can get hold of us um, you can see the telephone number you can get hold of us and say hey I've given my life to the Lord can you help me from here on out and we could either send you some material we can uh, put you in touch with a really good church near you uh, if you live in our area you can come to us you can follow us on YouTube but it is good to get connected into the family of God, to get connected into a local church, that your life changes being surrounded with the family of God. Please stay in touch. God bless you.